here is to pay for value. And let's, before doing that, take a little bit of a look at how does it, the payments, what is the flow of money? And I can tell you, you know that a little bit by some of the slides you did, but who pays for this? Insurance companies do, employers do, as, as you just pointed out, the majority of people are getting their coverage through employers. Government does, individuals do. All of the above, of course. Uh, but if you go to this, who pays for healthcare 2.0, who pays the insurance companies? Who pays for the employer's contribution? In essence, if you get a free contribution, sort of a free contribution from the employers, but it's in lieu of wages that you would have otherwise had. Who pays the taxes? Individuals do. We, we all basically pay for this. So there's this tendency to think if there's free health care, just to have somebody else pay for it. And in essence, that really doesn't work there that way. We're all paying for it in one way or the other. Now, this slide is a flow of funds. And again, a little bit similar to one, one of yours. But what we're looking at, if you take a look at the far right, how do providers get paid? Physicians, hospitals, the systems, the pharmacies, the others. And so you now go from the US population on the left at the very top. Of course, we have insurance premiums either through employers or employee. And then they pay it to intermediaries tending to be insurance companies. And then they pay the providers at least their share of the bill. Then for the government program, we have taxes that you've talked about and there are a variety of government programs and some of them are listed here. And some of those government programs, notice there's an arrow going up, actually give that government money to an insurance company that then pays the provider. Some of them give money directly to the provider right from the, to the, provider right from the government program. And then at the very bottom on the left, we have out-of-pocket payments, the co-pays, deductibles, or something that isn't covered by insurance and you decide as an individual, just buy it. A lot of cosmetic surgery, for instance, is that way. It's a direct purchase. So this is how those funds flow. <clears throat> now this, I think, is a bit of an interesting one. It takes a long time period, 40 years, 1975 to 2015. It is the total bar is more than just payments to providers. It's total healthcare expenditures. So that includes medical education. It includes research. It includes more than the providers. And that's why I don't want to spend too much time on that blue part because some of that's provider stuff, but a lot of it isn't. But this is showing how did, how did this pie of what the expenditures were change over that 40 year period. So if you look at the black, there's been a 7% increase that came from Medicaid, the program for lower income individuals. There's been an even bigger, slightly bigger share that has gone to the people over age 65. And part of that, of course, is that we're an aging society, especially with the baby boomers. And so you have more people that are older. The private insurance premiums have gone up by even more, 10%. But here is the one that people tend to forget about. And I kind of heard this in the comments. It's like we shouldn't have to pay anything out of pocket. And we think that, my gosh, these out of pocket payments are just outlandish. But if you go back in time, it was over a quarter of the total government expenditures came directly out of people's pockets. So from that perspective, while it's true, the, the deductibles and the coinsurance is going up, it's still quite a bit smaller percentage than it was before. So let's look again a little bit more granular than how do we pay for healthcare? We use an example, Elena, 65 year old, congestive heart failure, but she breaks a hip from a fall, goes to the emergency room in an ambulance, three days in the hospital, discharged to a nursing home, then re for rehabilitation and then has home health. Now, how will Medicare or most insurers pay for this care under the current fee-for-service system? The providers are clearly paid in silos. There's a payment, separate payment to the ambulance company. Separate payment to the hospital covers room and board, nursing, prescription drugs during the hospital stay. The physicians, they're paid separately, the ones that they take care of her in the hospital and those that take care of her afterwards. 
a daily payment is made to the skilled nursing facility to cover their services, their nursing services, prescription drugs, rehab services while in the nursing home, and then a per visit payment to home health agency afterwards. Now, these payment approaches have conflicting incentives. The hospital is paid one bundled fee. It's a diagnostic related group is what it's called. So you get, rather than the, uh, paying hospitals so much for the lab test, so much for the x-ray, they get one bundled amount depending on what the admission is. So the bundled amount for a total hip arthroplasty, for instance, is gonna be different than the bundled amount for a coronary artery bypass graft, but it is a lump sum bundle that goes to the hospital. So what's the incentive? Use fewer resources, discharge quickly, more admissions. The financial incentives. The rehab facility is per diem. What's the incentive there? You're getting paid per day, keep the patient in longer. Physicians are paid fee for service on the whole, not always, but the vast majority. The incentive, perform many services, and there's really no financial downside to physicians or other professionals that might provide unnecessary care. Now, here's a question I want you to think about. Do you think how a physician or other provider gets paid would influence how they practice medicine? Or would they simply practice medicine the way they think is right, regardless of how they got paid? Well, let's take a look at an example. So in the US, uh, hospitals, as we said, are paid a lump sum diagnostic related group. In Japan, it's quite different. We've done some work in Japan. They're paid by what's called a DPC, Diagnostic Procedure Code, but the key here is they're paid per diem. And as we talked about what the financial incentives were, under the lump sum amount in the US, the incentives are for lower lengths of stay. In the per diem amount, the incentives are for longer lengths of stay. So let's take total knee replacement and look at the two. In the US, it's the average length of stay for a knee replacement is a little over three days. So I want you all to get in your mind, what do you think it is in Japan? Do you think this payment approach where they get paid on a per diem amount would lead to longer lengths of stay in Japan or would they be about the same? So please, all of you, before I show you, get a number in your mind. Huge, huge difference. Now, as I said, we've done some work in Japan and I really don't think all of this is just the payment approach but I, because I think part of it is the culture of Japan and how their medical system has evolved. But I do firmly believe if they actually switched to paying lump sum amount per admission, this length of stay would drop, bingo, dramatically at, during, a, after that. Now, the individual patient is paying a lower share out of pocket and this kind of gives the impression that someone else is paying the bill. The current healthcare reimbursement system promotes volume over value, as you have all said. So is it surprising that we're seeing increases in healthcare costs? Probably not. Now, how do you try and control the spending? The Medicare program has done it through price line, what we call line item price control. So each little thing that they pay under fee for service, they set the price. There's a maximum price that can be paid for any Medicare, for a patient covered by Medicare. And there's quite a bit of complexity in, in determining what those prices are. So I'm gonna just show you how do, how do you determine what Medicare is gonna pay for a chest X-ray in Phoenix, Arizona, and they have a few formulas that they use. So you don't, you know, you'll, I, I, well, let me, you don't need to really know this. I'm just gonna comment on a few of these. This is just the first one. You have work RVUs, work GPCs, practice expense, malpractice RVUs, PLI gypsies. I, I'm not gonna go into these because you don't need to know it other than to know that each of these, each of those things has a formula in itself to come up with the amount for Phoenix, Arizona. Then you have 
a conversion factor and you have macro updates, budget neutrality adjustments, misvalued code targets. These things are all formulas as well. And this is how what was reported in the press as being a 0.5% in Medicare payment rates actually resulted in a 0.3% decrease to set each year for what they are paying. So everybody, uh, you know, there's a lot of different services that you can pay in for fee for service. You know, you can get your eyes examined, you can have a general uh, visit with your physician, there's all sorts of surgeries, all sorts of x-rays, all sorts of lab tests. So get a number in mind, how many different prices, if you're gonna have price control, that you have to set. You can put them in chat. I can see where you are. You're off by quite a factor because I think what you're forgetting is you're setting these for a geographic area. It's 1,418,000 different prices because there's a price set up for each region of a state. So it's, and you've seen those formulas, it's, it's pretty complex. Now, you, the government has to explain this. So each year, they issue a federal register report on how they're going to change payments in the next year under the care program. And here, the number of pages, this is fairly typical around, you end up with about 20,000 pages. So in the hospital, you have the uh, final rule for inpatient, for the final rule for hospital outpatient. Then you go to the physician and they have a quality payment program rule and physician fee schedule rule. They issue that. And then during the year, because it raises so many questions, they have to issue additional bulletins and special communications to explain it. At the end of the year, you've had about 20,000 pages so I ask you right now, if you're an independent physician seeing patients, do you think you're going to understand all this? There's probably a pretty good chance you could be breaking rules and not even know it because it becomes so complex. Now, in defense of the people that work in the Medicare program that do this, a lot of these are trying to make it more fair amongst all the patients and all of, all of the providers. But when you, as you do that, it just increases the complexity and eventually the complexity really works against you. Now, when I moved to Arizona, I really kind of liked the cowboy stuff when I got here. And then I found this book that really explained all you need to know about medical administration, uh, The Cowboy Guide to Life. And here are the Guide to Life-isms. The length of a report don't tell nothing about the size of the intellect. Well, Christ controls. You are all too young, but in the early 70s, the whole country's economy was put on price controls because we'd had big inflation. And C. Jackson Grayson, fascinating person, he was in charge of the U.S. price controls. It's interesting, his experience on that, he became an ardent person against price controls. He spent the rest of his life setting up yeah, he was an academic, but spent the rest of his life in, an, in a uh, think tank talking about the problems with price controls. And here's a quote, add price controls, you will see new services appear, expect on bundling of services with prices of individual units when added together, total more than the original services. Does that happen in Medicare? This is what we call the price control cycle. Start at the second line, uh, second bar uh, box down. So you think the costs are too high. So what do you do? You reduce the line item payments that providers get. So now you go down, you're a provider. So you're gonna get less money. So what do you do? You end up seeing more, if that happens year after year after year, and if it doesn't go down, the increase is just practically nothing. You see more patients per day. And then you order more tests and images. And that makes sense. If you're not gonna spend much time with a patient and you don't want to miss something, what are you going to do? You're going to order up more tests. So you add it up at the bottom, at the end of the day, the costs go up, bingo, take it around to the top and you go through the whole thing. We've done this, this, this experiment has been run and this is what happens. 
does it really, is that really true? Or, or if you really reduce the, what you paid under fee for service, wouldn't that reduce the cost? Well, let's take a look. These are two four year time periods. The first one on average per year, they in, the Medicare program increased what it paid physicians 3.4% per year. And then when you add it up, because over time there have been more services per patient that have been done because more things are available as time comes along. So the actual physician expenditures per Medicare beneficiary went up 7.4%. Next four year time period, what the Medicare program was paying physicians actually decreased by 0.7% per year. So here's my question to you. What do you think happened to physician expenditures per Medicare beneficiary? Did they go down? Did they go up a lot? The answer is the incredible. It went up exactly the same. The how a physician practices is a big part of this. So at any rate, if you, as you see what's happened with Medicare, we should not be surprised that providers are spending less time with patients and that more tests are being ordered. It's a natural result of this. So <clears throat> with price controls, there's one state that actually, it's mainly Medicare, okay, that has the price controls and Medicaid. But, th but that doesn't exist with private insurance. There, it's a negotiated rate between providers and payers. But <clears throat> there's one state, Maryland, that has what's called all payer rate controls. So they set the rates for all payers. Medicare pays a lot more and private insurance pays a lot less in, Medic in Maryland. So what's happened to healthcare expenditures per capita over a long 91 through 2014, here are the dollars, there are the years, and we're gonna look at the US and at Maryland. Did the price controls lead to reductions in the increase of costs compared to the rest of the country? Not really, they actually went up a little bit more, but you, the trend really is pretty much the same. So to me, the, price con the problem with the price control is look in the right in the middle of this slide. Total cost is a really simple formula. It's the price you pay for something times the use rate. How many of whatever you're paying for is done? How many hospital admissions are there? How many surgeries are done? And this use rate is really a direct function of what we call medical practice style, how physicians tend to conduct a clinical practice. <clears throat> now, it varies by region of the country. Here was a fascinating article, it looked at high expense areas and low expense areas. I guess this is a couple of different ones. What they found was utilization of services, not local price differences, drives regional payment variation. Most of the variation was not due to differences in prices, but rather differences in volume. This is a fascinating one to me, as you look at volume, how, how volume of medical services per capita be kind of the same, wouldn't it? Don't you think by geography? Not really. This <clears throat> took a look at, my, at all the uh, metropolitan areas in the country. The greatest use was in Miami, Florida, and the lowest use was in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I don't know if we have anybody in this class from Miami, or somebody from La Crosse, Wisconsin. But it is huge, two-fold difference. And this thing actually adjusted for all sorts of things that might have led to differences of use. A the demographics of the population, the uh, beneficiary's health status, whether they were getting graduate medical education add-ons, they corrected for all that, two-fold difference. What distinguishes a low cost area from a high cost area? This was, there's an fascinating study. It was done by Peter Orzog. Peter Orzog was the director of management and budget under President Obama. He's an economist. Before that, he uh, headed the Congressional Budget Office, which evaluated all these things. He got really interested in healthcare when he was at the CBO. 
he's a really good guy too. And how do I know that? Because he's actually even a bigger country music fan than I am. And Denny can actually verify that from when we have talked to him. And I'm a big country music fan. So at any rate, he looked at high cost areas, low cost areas, and he's trying to figure out what, what determines whether you're a high cost area, low cost area. So the way his, this, his study worked, an index of one means that there's absolutely no difference on this particular service. So look at mammograms for women 65 to 69, 1.0. That meant mammograms use rate was exactly the same in high cost areas and low cost areas. So now let's get into the key points here. What were the things that led to the high cost area being high cost? The biggest single one, two-fold factor, high cost areas, low cost areas, as he made adjustments for demographics and things, inpatient days in the intensive care unit. Now, when you think about it, that makes sense. Where's the most expensive place to take to provide medical care? In an intensive care unit. And what this is showing is there are huge variations in how frequently intensive care units get used. What were the other factors? Total inpatient days, the highest cost is in the hospital, evaluation and management, that's physician visits, imaging tests, diagnostic tests. It's use rate of services. What's the, clini what's the clinician's practice style? Now, is, could it possibly be, be that I the people in intensive care units might not need to be there? It's probably not true with, with COVID that we've been in, but we'll eventually get out of that, I think. And let's look at the period before. This is data that was done at the UCLA, very good medical center. And this was their own data. And what they said was high risk patients are the ones that should be in the intensive care unit. And they categorized patients as high risk, in other words, should be in the intensive care unit and low risk. And then they looked at the distribution. Here's what they found. A little bit less than half of the patients actually should be in an ICU. A little over half really didn't have a medical condition that justified it. So there are huge variations, even in really good medical centers. So now pay for value. What, are we, what, if, what would we try to do in a pay for value system? What this graph does, it looks at quality, patient outcomes, safety, a safe environment. Did you have an infection went in the hospital, et cetera, service, patient satisfaction. You can come up with an index. We've done this for every teaching hospital in the country. And then you can look at relative resource use on the horizontal axis. Now, what do you put in there? You put this data together for every medical center. There will be all kinds of dots in here and they'll be spread out, sped throughout this graph. As I said, we actually in our ASU program, we've done this for every teaching hospital in the United States. Where do you wanna be? You wanna be in the upper left. Good, effect, good effectiveness, in other words, you have very good outcomes and you're lower than average cost as opposed to that bottom right side where you have poor outcomes and you're really expensive. You don't wanna be down there. So can you develop a payment system, that's where you wanna be, that would kind of have financial incentives to put people in that upper left box? Because if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. We haven't stopped digging yet with regard to how we're paying for healthcare. Because what's doing, we're following the, the fallacy of paying for X and, and expecting something, paying for Y, expecting X. So if you pay for performance, and that is an old, it's, it's something the way we started out doing a, a few years ago, it tended to be process. What's the difference between process and outcome? Let's say, let's say you, um, rip out a, an L, a, a, ACL and you're gonna have surgery. So you went in a process item, did they do the right imaging when you went in? Did they do the right drugs when you went in? Those are all process items. Whereas if you're looking at outcomes, you're saying, did you die in the hospital? Did you, when you got done with the hospital, could you get back to normal activity? Those are outcomes. If you're gonna pay for performance, and this is what places have done, the United Kingdom actually has gone quite in on this sort of thing, but you're gonna get a lot of processes. If you pay fee for service, you're gonna get a lot of services. If you pay for cheap, that's just another way of saying, 
pay really low fee for service, you're going to get even more services. A great example of this is Japan physician rates and Japan physician visits per capita. Japan regulators pride themselves in how low they pay their physicians for office visits and those sorts of things. So what do physicians do? They have to see a lot of patients and so they don't see them for very long. It's kind of a joke that in, in Japan, if you get to see a physician for two minutes, you're then pretty happy. And consequently, physician, uh, patients go back to physicians many, many times. I think in the US, it's about four physician visits per capita on average. And I think Japan is probably something like 15 or 18. Again, in, it's partially influenced by the payment if you pay relative value units. So that's in these schemes Medicare uses. And they, they put a value on each thing you do. And the way the relative value units have been established, they're higher relative values assigned to procedures and surgery and radiology. So since your payment approach is based to an extent on that, guess what? They get paid more, those specialty dues they do get paid more and docs go into those. If you pay for value, maybe that'd be the best chance of actually getting value. So the issue is, how do you do that? There are a number of ways. I'm pretty sure you will have already seen this, that value to us is patient outcomes, safe environment, service over total cost per patient over some period of time. And the, the majority of payment schemes still, they, they're trying to get there, but they really haven't done it very well from our standpoint. We have suggested in our little program at ASU, a first step going towards establishing payment based on an expanded DRG. DRGs is how, are how pay, hospitals are paid. So it would use that as a base it's a patient classification that relies on the reason for hospitalization and the cost the hospital has. But the physician services during that hospitalization right now are not included. So in our expanded DRG, we take the current DRG, we would add uh, post-discharge care. So you'd make it for a longer period of time and you would include all of the physician services during that period of time. So it's another form of bundled payment. The bundle would cover related care for the medical condition for let's say 30 to 60 days after hospitalization. You take a payment model that's already familiar because that's what hospitals have been under and you'd put the hospitals and physicians at financial risk for a patient's health for that period of time. It's kind of a forcing function to get the providers to collaborate more and to relentlessly look at ways to increase the quality. And this, the way this really works, where, where people have tried this, you've got to reduce the number of complications that patients have once they end up in the hospital. Now the providers, if you do this, and should be free to practice medicine, whatever fashion they want, as long as, long as they're responsible for their outcomes, the patient outcomes and the cost. As they gain experience, we think that providers would manage more and more risk. And it's interesting, way back in 2009, in a survey of, health, of opinion leaders in healthcare, most felt that moving toward bundled payments was kind of a good option to move towards value. We haven't done a very good job of doing it yet. Here's a quote from Dr. Ezekiel Manuel health policy person uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, saving by the bundle. So here, let me just read it. Pa imagine a patient who comes to the hospital for hip replacement. Patient will be billed separate right now for x-rays, lab tests, surgeon fees, anesthesiologist, rehab, hospital bill, visit the doctor. In a bundle payment sy system, all the bills are rolled into one standard hip replacement charge. The idea is to force, in other words, financial to force, all of the patient's care providers to work together. They have strong incentive to eliminate unnecessary tests, use less expensive plant, implants, drugs, and devices, and to prevent infections and complications. Again, where this has been put into place, this is the key. And I should mention, we aren't the only country that is starting to use this. Sweden has done it, for instance, 
And what they found is the way that you come out under this sort of approach, if you're a medical center, is you, re, you end up reducing complications in the hospital. And now that's a good thing if you're a patient, right? It's important to, re, if you're gonna do pay for value, it's important to remember the cost distribution facts. The highest cost, 20% of patients. What percent of total cost do they have? You know the old rule, right? Yeah. 81% of cost. More important question, I think. Lowest cost, 50% of patients. What percent are they of cost? You know it's got to be 19 or lower, right? 3%. So 50% of patients are only 3% of the total cost. Now, why do I think this is so important? Because I think many people that are trying to control costs get to more value they're trying to put in place payment systems that deal with everybody. And so you get all this complexity and a huge amount of it is going to end to this huge share of patients that are not much of the total cost. If getting at cost is one thing you wanna do, you've gotta remember this 20%, 80%. So true pay for value, it means tying payments to that. Outcomes should be condition or DRG specific. We think if we went to expanded DRGs, they, uh, you ought to favor an independent or oversight of the outcome measures because the government efforts end up being very political and they get watered down and they end up turning into process measures. In fact, one of the things we've recommended, let's say you were gonna do this, you're gonna to go to the expanded DRG. What I would do is I, for the applicable specialty, let's say it's orthopedic surgery for orthopedic procedures. I'd go to the orthopedic society and say, we're gonna to move to this. Now you come up with the outcome measures we're gonna use that we're gonna, we're gonna measure you by. Let them come up with it. And then you'll probably get ones that that, that that specialty would agree on. Then you measure them and you look at the cost. Um, there is experience that providers will self-organize. If you look at what happened in the hospital with DRGs, on the four-year period before DRGs went in, 80 to 85, the four-year period afterwards, length as they organized, length of stay went down by 8%, admissions, went, admissions per, hunt, per thousand went down 23%, hospital days per thousand went down 29%. The provide, and the government didn't force them to do it, it just changed how it was gonna be paying and the providers organized. Get away from these complex formulas. We think it should be based on reality-based pricing, which we think is the, what is the actual cost for resources in medical centers that get the best risk-adjusted outcomes? Everybody has to have some margin, add on 3% or whatever you want, and that would be your payment amount. Now let's show you how you would do this. We're just about at the end here. Each dot is a hospital. On the left, you have an index number for whatever EDRG. This is actually one that we put together. You don't need to know which one it is. It's just the concept. And then you have the cost. Each dot is a medical center. This is how you get spread out. What we're saying for the ERGs, just that line across the right is the top third of hospitals on outcomes. And then you have the median cost of all the hospitals. So now go up to that top left bar and look at the median cost and draw your line there. That's what you're gonna pay all the hospitals who are in the top on outcomes. And the, all of those on that are below the top third you're gonna pay them 5% less because their quality isn't good. Now I, I can tell you what would happen because I've worked in healthcare for so long. If we actually did this, look at the bottom right uh, quadrant and dots. That one that has the, you can see it is basically the lowest value medical center in the United States teaching hospital. I'll guarantee you if you started paying them, the physicians that were practicing there would start calling their buddies up in that happened to be at hospitals in the upper left quadrant, and they'd be asking them, how do you do that? What is it? How do you, how are you able to do that? And you'd start a forcing function of getting people to move there. 
So there are num this is just one potential way. There's a number of approaches that could be used, but a couple of key points, the payment approach needs to concentrate, if you're interested in costs, on where the costs are. And I really don't think price controls are the way to do it. Kind of set it up for what we have called reality pricing. Nothing's perfect, use the good, improve the bad. With that, I'm gonna stop, Natalie.